for that moment when the driver is isolated with his own thoughts. This is Rick Mears, two-time winner this year on the kart circuit. Tom Sneva, he was fourth at Indianapolis this year. Gordon Johncock, this year's Indianapolis champion. The defending champion, Macho Kart. His only win has been here a year ago. The rookie in the first row is Don Whittington. He's looking for his first victory. Behind him, Kevin Kogan, as he pulls away the man who caused the crash just before the start of the Indy 500. As very slowly, the car moving out of the pit. The drivers listening. Listening. Now, as the drivers pull away from the grid, listening for any sound in their car, let's take a look at the top qualifiers for today's race. When the qualifying opened, it was Mario Andretti in car number 40 that screamed around the high banks. 205.23 miles an hour, the fastest qualifier. Then out came Rick Mears in his car number one, denoting the national championship from last year. He was the second fastest qualifier of the day. And the Indianapolis winner, Gordon Johncock, in car 20, qualified above 200 miles an hour as well. Johncock followed by Don Whittington, qualifying just over 202 miles per hour. And then it was Tom Steva, twice the national driving champion, looking for his seventh IndyCar win to match the number on his car. And Pancho Carter, the defending champion, last year's win, his only IndyCar victory in nine years of racing. Kevin Kogan, in his PC-10, hoped to regain a position of prominence after a bad start at Indianapolis. And the winningest driver in all IndyCar racing, A.J. Foyt, at 196 miles an hour. Bobby Rahal, refreshed by his first Indy win at Cleveland just two weeks ago. The pace car on the back straight. Coming around turn three as the field is just beginning to form up. And you will notice that on the pole is Rick Mears. Now the fastest qualifier was Mario Andretti, but he is at the back of the pack. Here's that story. Let's go down to the pits with Gary Gerald. Gary? Earlier this week, there was an abundance of optimism for Mario Andretti. After winning the pole position at better than 205 miles per hour, figuring that the law of averages was finally swinging his way after recent frustrations at Indianapolis and Le Mans. But yesterday afternoon, in the final practice session, that dark cloud returned, and while running laps in the 202 mile per hour bracket, Mario's Wildcat found the wall in turn two. Dejected and frustrated, but thankfully uninjured, Mario immediately returned to the pits while safety crews towed his damaged racer. Even before Andretti made his way back to pit road, his backup car was ready for service in the final minutes of practice. Immediately, he had that second car running laps at 199 miles per hour. Certainly encouraging news for the veteran driver and his crew, but with the loss of the pole car came the anticipated confirmation that Mario must now start at the back of the 34-car field, a fact not lost on a downcast and ready. Well, just uh, to start from the back, it's the only thing is a long race. I have a lot better chance, obviously, of recovery, but... Uh, you know, obviously, it's going to affect me somewhat. There's no question. Uh, if I have to start from the back, I'm not going to be starting with my pet car. And a touch of irony with the loss of Mario's pet car. It was almost at the identical point on the racetrack where A.J. Foyt had that devastating crash last year. A.J. hit a steel guardrail fence. You saw the devastation. The right side of the car sheared off. A.J. nearly lost his right arm. But now, replacing that steel guardrail, cement crash wall. Mario hit in the same spot yesterday, but as he glanced off the cement, Mario walked away uninjured. Now, a very significant factor coming up as this race moves closer. The field bunches up the green flag. Mario Mario Andretti at the back of the pack is nearly a half mile behind the front row. That, of course, poses significant problems for Mario. And with that aspect of the story, our colleague in the pits today, Bruce Jenner.
Well, Mario's got a lot of thinking to do. Not only is he going to start a half mile behind the leader, he's got the entire field to contend with, 33 cars. Out of that, nine rookies. So he's going to be moving up very fast on a lot of very inexperienced drivers. That puts him in a very vulnerable and dangerous situation. Now, there is one good thing about starting in the back of the pack. Usually in the first few laps, problems develop in the middle of the field where all the traffic is. Mario being in the back has an opportunity to see that, slow his car down. One major concern of the drivers is getting hit from the back, and Mario will not have that problem since he'll be in the back. So Mario's got a lot of thinking to do in these first few laps. Now let's go back up to Charlie Jones. All right, thank you, Bruce. The field is forming up. We'll set the 34 cars. Row one, Rick Mears, 15 wins. John Cock, 23 wins. Don Whittington is the rookie in the first row. On the inside of the second row, Tom Sneva, the track record holder, the defending champion, Poncho Carter, and Kevin Kogan is on the outside. Row three, A.J. Foyt, Bobby Rahal, and Mike Mosley. Watch Foyt. He may make an early jump. Row four, Johnny Rutherford, Al Unser, and Jeff Brabham. Rutherford's card just seven days old. The fifth row, Herm Johnson, Spike Gelhaus, and Roger Mears. The sixth, Ganassi, Howdy Holmes, and Tom Bigelow. The seventh, Jim Hickman, Gary Bettenhausen, and George Snyder. And in row eight, It'll be Johnny Parsons, Tony Bettenhausen, and Jose Garza. The ninth row, Jerry Carl, Pat Bedard, Bill Alsop. The tenth row, Hector Rabake, Dick Simon, and Scott Brayton. R rounding out the field, France Kruger and Dreddy. The promoter's option is Ken Hamilton. We're ready to go racing. The pole sitter, Rick Mears, brings him down toward the green flag. The pace picks up. Mears begins to accelerate, and the green flag is waving at the Michigan 500 as Rick Mears is side-by-side -side with Gordon Johncock. Johncock drums out into front. Rick Mears drops in behind. Johncock begins to accelerate, coming off of the second turn and screaming down that back stretch now. It's Johncock in this early going, already picking up a lead over Rick Mears. Meanwhile, at the back of the pack, Andretti has already passed five cars going after his six that he has picked off as he goes down the back straight. The leader is the number 20 car of Gordon Johncock, right behind him, the one car of Rick Mears. Don Whittington has moved into third place as they come across the line to complete lap number one. And Reddy now has picked off seven cars, and he's moving into traffic. One lap now complete. It is still Gordon Johncock out in front, but Mears begins to close a little bit in the second turn. They're coming onto the back stretch. That's dust that Gordon Johncock went over. No problem with the car. First place, still Johncock. Mears second. Don Whittington content to sit back and observe in third place. And Reddy adds three more to his total. He has picked off 10 cars. He's going after his 11th down the back straight. It's a nice, smooth start. There is Mario Andretti as he runs right on past George Snyder and is really moving up. That's Gary Bettenhausen, Tony Bettenhausen. Bettenhausen actually sitting in front of him as Andretti continue, continues now to move up through this field. With that last pass, Andretti has picked off 11 cars. He goes after his 12th and 13th, going into turn one, and he's got him. Andretti moving smoothly, and look how well that wild can handles. Andretti still with that black cloud over him. He is trying to work down a season of frustration as he works his way up through the field. Here's the leader, Gordon Johncock, and that is Rick Mears down low as Rick Mears now tries to close and pass Johncock. Johncock is running on the high side of the race course. Mears a little slower line down low. Johncock still out in front. Three laps are now complete. Gordon Johncock still leading. Rick Mears in second place. Don Whittington sitting down in the third position. Yellow flag flies at Michigan International Speedway. The report comes from the officials that debris has been dropped on the race course. So Nick Fenoro puts out the yellow flag. Gordon Johncock and Rick Mears will have to stop their battle for the moment, and the field will slow. And in the process, Mario Andretti picked off a total of 14 cars out of this field of 34. The yellow flag is out, and we'll be back to more racing at the Michigan 500 in just a moment. We're still under the yellow flag here. There was debris on the track, Paul. Well, out in the third turn, they sent the crews to pick up several park particles. We couldn't tell exactly what it was, but the question, of course, always, Charlie, is did it come off the race car, and if it did, whose? And once they determine that, how dire is the circumstance that it might have created? It doesn't look like it was a serious part that came off the cars. And of course, one of the big stories here is Mario Andretti starting in the 33rd position. We had him isolated at the start of the race. 
he was told before the race that he would not be allowed to do any passing until he passed the start finish line. Now in the history of IndyCar racing, only three times has a driver come from the back of the pack to win the race. But those have been short races at 150 and 200 miles an hour, uh, 200 miles total. In a 500 mile race, as you watch Andretti just picking up driver after driver, in a distance of 500 miles, a driver has never come from the back of the pack from position 33 to win the race. Well, you can see that Mario began his move very early. He's already moved up to 20th place just in the few laps that we ran before the yellow flag. And I think Mario had conversations, Charlie, with those cars that were sitting directly in front of him because now here as he closes on Bill Alsop and Jim Hickman and Pat Bedard, he ducks down to the inside. I think he told everybody, fellas, I'm going to be come on, coming on through and just watch for me and get out of the way. We figured this morning that he'd be going from pit to pit talking to every driver. Yeah. Giving, giving him the idea to, you know, check the mirror because I'll be coming after you. So Mario Andretti has now moved up to 20th position. There again, you see Andretti as he was closing on George Schneider in that number 35 car. The pace car has come off of the race course as we're back to live action. And Gordon Johncock brings the field down. The green flag flies, and Gordon Johncock continues his lead at the Michigan 500 across the line. Rick Mears now begins to close, come up high. That is A.J. Point that has moved up to do contest with the leaders once again. And Andretti now is in 18th position. He has passed Cars. Going after 17th in turn two. And he's got it and he picks up 16 along the way. He's in 16th position. Gordon Johncock in the Wildcat 8B as Rick Mears closes in behind him now. These two cars at the beginning of the season were far, far apart on development. But Johncock and his teammate Mario Andretti have been doing a lot of development for the Wildcats and now they are running almost equal. There is Mario Andretti as he is moving up through that field and he moves back and forth. First turn, first turn, two cars spinning. And comes spinning down in front of pit row. The yellow flag is out as Andretti, just in front of that crash, moved in slot number 14. And Herm Johnson in a wrecked car sitting up on the track. There is Tony Bettenhausen. Jose Le Garza still sliding backwards, trying to get his car around. It doesn't appear damaged. It looks like he wants to get moving. There is Herm Johnson, his car, and Eagle badly damaged, the fastest stock block in the field. But its day is obviously over the right side, ripped off of that car. But look at Herm Johnson, climbs out of the car and runs to safety. So the yellow flag is out at Michigan International Speedway. We have our first accident on lap number eight. And again, Herm Johnson is part of the story here. This is Roger Mears. A hard luck story for Roger Mears. He has had a terrible season with regard to accidents just like this one. He is in his first full season in IndyCar racing. Two weeks ago at the Cleveland race, he had an accident. He had a concussion. He virtually didn't remember that accident. Now he's in an accident once again. There is Herm, uh, there's uh, Bentonhausen as he tries to get back uh, over to his pit area. And the indication are that all of the drivers are okay as a result of this accident coming off the fourth turn on lap number eight. Roger Mears apparently wants to stay with that car. It doesn't appear that he is trapped in any way. Maybe he's thinking there's a possibility of, of doing some repairs. He's come up in the street. There's Herm Johnson coming in. Those of you who saw the telecast a year ago will remember the fire at Herb Johnson's pit that started the, con the conflagration here. Roger Mears still in the car looking to see if it if it appears there shouldn't be any any situation there that would keep him from climbing out we'll have to keep an eye on this Charlie all right let's go down to Bruce Jenner Bruce all right Herm what happened uh, the motor blew apparently or it had lost power I couldn't get down out of the groove and pull in front of somebody and I I've got tagged from behind from somebody and it shot me into the wall but you're all right. I believe so. Fortunately, the car isn't. That's a tough way to start this one off. I don't know if we're going to be able to come to Michigan anymore. Every time we come here, we seem to have some kind of a disaster. I don't know if it's Michigan or... <laughs> I hope it's not Michigan. It's, well, at least it's not fire this time. Well, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, sorry it had to be us again. All right, let's go back to Charlie. All right, thank you, Bruce. Another hard luck story, of course, is Jose Lee Garza, who this year has been having his problems, and he came spinning down on the grass, which separates uh, pit row from the track itself here. Yellow flag is still out. Ten laps are complete. 
Bill Alsop needs a tow. He's, he's shaking his hand saying, I need somebody to hook a rope on my car and pull it. He stopped dead coming off of uh, off of the backstretch. And they had a complete dead stop now. So uh, Bill Alsop needs some help as well. All right, Paul. Last year's fire here in Michigan initiated new safety features concerning the tanks and fueling operations. These guidelines are designed to reduce the risk of a fire during the fueling process. Without question, the most feared element at any racetrack is fire. And last July, in the Michigan 500, fire of mammoth proportions erupted in the pits of Herm Johnson. Within seconds, the blaze intensified into one of the most devastating scenes of potential racetrack disaster witnessed in recent years. During the initial minutes, as great firefighters waded into that inferno, there were concerns the fire might race through the pits unchecked. An explosion around Johnson's refueling tank added to the concern before firemen eventually gained the upper hand. That was last year. In an effort to avoid a reoccurrence of that scene we saw a year ago here at Michigan, several new stringent fire safety regulations have been implemented for the 1982 season. Many of them somewhat technical in nature, but a couple of obvious ones. Brand new valves on the top and at the bottom of the actual fueling tank. Another critical one here, a positive shutoff valve on the actual refueling nozzle. This valve has to be cocked before this is inserted into the side of the car. As the sleeve comes back, fuel of course goes quickly into the car and then the very instant that this is pulled away from the car the flow of fuel automatically is sealed off here in the hose now to give us a demonstration Greg Nelson who was involved in the refueling in Herm Johnson's pit last year will show us exactly what happens we have water in the tanks rather than fuel for the demonstration purposes as this nozzle is inserted into the car the sleeve comes back the flow of fuel into the car the instant that it is pulled away from the car, of course, the flow of fuel, in this case water, is quickly shut off. Now, Herm's crew has gone one step further. In this ring around the nozzle, they have implemented an actual sprinkling device so that the moment that this is activated, Steve Erickson at the pit, a flow of water in the event of any accidental fuel spillage will quickly wash down that flow of fuel. The important point to remember, to have a spillage like we had last year that triggered that fire, this year it would take the malfunction of at least three major valves, two on the tank, one at the nozzle. And of course, officials are working desperately hard this year to avoid any recurrence of what we saw last year here at Michigan. Now, there's more to the fire safety situation that deals directly with the car. Paul, in the cockpit of Herm's car, has that story. Well, Gary, should a fire actually occur, there are several systems designed on the car to protect both the driver and the race car. The driver, of course, is covered head to toe with several layers of fireproof clothing. But Herm Johnson has gone several steps further. He has, as all the cars do, an onboard fire extinguisher system. There is a red button here on the dash panel at his right hand. When he pushes that, an invisible firefighting chemical sprays not only in the engine compartment, but in the cockpit, which can snuff out the fire. Herm has gone even a step further. He carries this system. It's a fireproof hose that will deliver air from a tank inside the car for one minute. This is very important because a fire would generate superheated air, make it difficult for him to breathe, and therefore difficult to escape. But with this cool air system, he can breathe, he can see, and he can climb out of the car himself. Oh, now, cars is pissed. Paul. Well, Garza, of course, was involved in that accident, but I think he just spun the car to avoid it. He slid to a stop coming across the grass on the infield. He then brought the car around to the pits, and it was obvious that the skirts on the right side of his race car were ripped off during that slide. Now, as a result of that, the crew is right now making every attempt they can to reattach the skirts, make some sort of situation that will create downforce on the right side of the car. If they can't do that, they're going to have to take the skirts off both sides because the downforce would be very unequal so they're working on that car now trying to decide what they will do to repair the damage to the car and get Jose Lee Garza back into action and of course Bobby Unzer is the team manager on that car and he's overseeing the entire operation we're still under the yellow a look at the top five John Cock, Mears, Foyt, Whittington, Sneva, and Dreddy is in 14th a beautiful shot of the Irish Hills we are high above Michigan 500 in our live coverage.
the second year of the Michigan 500. And what an event this has become. And the excitement of last year carries across to this year. Well, there's no question about that, Charlie. The race started off uh, rather smooth and a little debris on the race course. And then on lap number eight, seven laps ago, suddenly the yellow was out because cars came spinning off of the fourth turn. Two cars that were spinning and involved in that accident, that of Garza and that of Roger Mears that you see here, are apparently repairable. They're working on Roger Mears's car, trying to repair the nose, which had slid off during the spin. And apparently, they'll be putting Roger Mears back into the action. Jose Le Garza has all already gone back into competition. All right, we will have one more lap under the yellow. There's Bobby Unzer, the team manager for Garza. And he's, he's talking on the radio, trying to pump Hosele back up and get him ready to go into competition again. It's tough after a spin like that to say, I really want to go out and do it some more. The underwriting story here is Mario Andretti. Had to go to his backup car. He was the fastest qualifier. When you go to your backup car, that means you go to position number 33. Now, in, with 16 laps complete, Andretti has already moved up to 14th in the race. And never in the history of a 500 has a driver come from behind, from the last spot, the 33rd spot, because here we have 34 with the promoter's option and Ken Hamilton being in, but not from the 33rd to win a 500-mile race. Well, Andretti actually, of course, started back there at the Indianapolis 500 in 1981, moved up, came in second physically on the racetrack, and then the decision on the winner was reversed. Andretti was made the winner, then reversed again. Bobby Unzer was given the win back. So the point is, it is possible. If anybody can do it, Mario can. He almost did it before. But now Gordon John Cox. At 16 laps complete as our leader, the pace car comes off the race course, and we should head back to green flag racing once again. They come down signal file. John Cox picks up the pace. Mears begins to close just a little bit. That's A.J. Boyd sitting back in third position, and the green flag flies. So Gordon John Cox leads them out once again, and Boyd closes just a bit. And then a pack of cars, including Don Whittington and Kevin Kogan, sitting back in the fourth and fifth position as John Cox leads them through the second turn and heads down that long Backstretch. Now watch as John Cox heads into the third turn. You'll see the back end of the car take a little bounce. There's a terrible bump heading into that third turn. There it goes as he just as he heads into the turn. And a really skillful driver can use that bump to pitch the back end of the car just enough to be very fast. John Cox can do it. Some of the others are having trouble with it. Gordon John Cox under the green flag once again at Michigan International comes across the line followed by Mears and Foyt. And Dreddy now has picked off two more racers. He is in a 12th position, and Johnny Rutherford is in front of him as Andretti goes underneath him. A terrific battle. There is Johnny Rutherford and Mario Andretti as they're side by side. Two very skilled veterans. They love to race with one another. Johnny Rutherford is in a brand new race car. It's bright yellow, but it is not the Chaparral. That is a new march that is just about one week old, and Johnny has less than 100 miles in that race car, so he's going to tiptoe at the start of this race, trying to sort it out. Andretti, on the other hand, knows that wild Cat ate very well, and his objective is to get up to the front. Rutherford coming into the race only six hot laps in this car. Andretti has passed him. Andretti is 11th. Rutherford is 12th. Mario Andretti moving up to 11th position now, and he is really just over five seconds behind these two men. The leaders, as Rick Mears makes a challenge alongside Gordon Johncock. They scream into the turn. Mears uses the low side of the race course to his advantage. His car is working very well down there, and Rick Mears picks up the lead. Johncock drops back to second, and A.J. Foyt maintains his position in third place. We now have 20 laps complete. Andretti picking off another car as he continues on his move. Car number 17, that is Ken Hamilton, who is running rather slow. It's lap traffic. He's picked him off. Rick Mears is out in front. Gordon Johncock in the number 20 car sits back in second place, and he's dropping back just a bit. As they came over the line, it was only two-tenths of a second that separated these two cars. But now, Mears is beginning to do what he did in the early going of this year, and that is, once he sees daylight, he begins to disappear. But all of the drivers here say, staying in the race is going to be the trick to make it through 500 miles. Continues to run. Now picks up some of the slower traffic. Very carefully moves around slower cars as they begin to lap the field. And Gordon Johncock, whether it is of his own control or not, decides that he will lay back and watch Mears. And we're looking.
get a classic duel. Well, the classic duel at Indy between Mears and Gordy is history. How does he describe that moment? The words of Gordon Johncock. You know, we were side to side when we come down for the white flag lap. In fact, I think uh, Rick edged a little bit ahead of me uh, right after we passed the start finish line. But uh, I had a little stronger engine, I believe, than Rick did and was able to carry me on in uh, to the corner better uh, than Rick was. But uh, here is, uh, you know, we, like I said, we could run through the corner here side to side with no problem, you know, and have lots of room here. Car 7, we have a problem. Tom Smeva looks like he blew the turbocharger, blew the engine. The yellow flag will come out because he may have also deposited some oil and debris on the racetrack. Tom Smeva, who is the current track record holder here at a speed of well above 211 miles an hour. And this is going to bring the leaders in. It's a bit early for stops, but first and second place, both head into the pits. Gordon Johncock is in. There is Rick Mears rolling to a stop. Mears, the Penske crew, goes to work on that number one gold charge. There's the wildcat of John Cock. A.J. Foyt, who was in third place, also came in as soon as the yellow flag came out. Now, Rick Mears moves back into the competition. His crew's done their work. Mears has been practicing pulling away from these pit stops. They have had some problems this year. The fuel injection system is fairly sophisticated, and some of the cars are having trouble pulling away, but no problem for either Rick Mears or for Gordon Johncock. As the yellow flag comes out, when Tom Steva blows an engine. We have 23 laps complete. The leader is now taking their pit stops, as Paul was talking about. Of course, this will juggle the standings for a while. We look at Tom Sneva with his problems. A 500-mile race, now with 24 laps complete. Mario Andretti heads into the pits. Andretti will come in for some service. The uh, Patrick team apparently not wanting to bring both cars in at the same time. So they brought their faster car in first and decided to hold Andretti back. Now the crew goes to work on Mario Andretti's machine. Right side change of tires. There's Johnny Rutherford in the pits. That's the new March. He's been in here for a little while. He uh, actually pulled down in the pits before Steva had his trouble. And they're looking at the back of the car. That usually indicates something is wrong with the engine, but they have not yet raised the bonnet on the engine. We're under the yellow. The leaders coming in and out of the pits, and we'll be back to more racing at the Michigan 500. We'll return in just a moment. Stay with us. And the Goodyear Blip Enterprise rising high above the Michigan 500. Well, we're under the yellow flag at the Michigan 500 with 26 laps complete. This yellow light came out when Tom Sneva blew an engine on his Texaco Star. The engine let go very suddenly. They went yellow right away because when it goes like that, you're not sure how much oil or how many parts might have ended up on the racetrack. You saw Andretti move past when that occurred. The choreography of pit stop is essential. Here's Gary Gerald with the report. For those who strive so diligently for victory in IndyCar racing, there's no argument with the long-standing claim that races are won and lost in the pits. During the course of today's Michigan 500, this scene will be repeated more than a half dozen times by the hard-working crews serving each of the drivers. A precisely choreographed piece of business where five men come over the wall to change tires and add upwards of 40 gallons of fuel in a matter of seconds. This is the Rick Mears pit crew in action, the same crew that was ravaged by fire a year ago at Indianapolis. This special demonstration for our Sports World cameras last summer reunited the Mears team for the first time since that horrifying experience at Indy. Let's look again at the specific functions of each crew member as Mears' ghoul charge is serviced. First, airjacker Chuck Sprague connects an air hose that instantly elevates the car on four jacks. At the same time, Jerry Briand, who this year replaces John Haup, wields an impact wrench to replace the right rear wheel. As the car comes down off the jacks, both men race to the rear to help push Mears away. At the right front location, Chief Mechanic Peter Parrott handles another high-speed wheel gun to change the right front tire. As he pirouettes away from the wheel back to the wall, Parrott must be absolutely certain the hose is clear of the car. Meanwhile, Mark Wesneski and Bill Murphy work in tandem to fuel the car. Wesneski vents the top of the fuel tank as Murphy couples the fuel hose to the sides of the tank. When fuel appears in the vent hose, both men simultaneously pull their hoses and jump back. In a matter of seconds, the team concept of championship racing is put to the supreme test in a well-orchestrated series of maneuvers that sends Rick Mears back on the track.
We're back at the Michigan 500 as they're coming around at the completion of lap 28, and the green flag flies. We're back to green flag racing once again at the Michigan 500. And right now, Rick Mears is out in front, but Gordon Johncock screams by on the outside and picks up the lead. That's Tony Bettenhausen as they're moving below. There's Johncock in number 20. Rick Mears in number one is right behind him. And ready, meanwhile, continuing through the pack. He picked off Pancho Carter, so he gains one more position. There is Andretti down the back straight, driving maybe the race of his life. Andretti coming up behind Hector Rabake. Andretti is really just at six seconds behind the leaders. He could close that distance in no time. Mario Andretti brings it off the corner. There is Rabake behind him and sitting back at number three cars, Pancho Carter. has now moved up to third, Don Whittington in fourth. Andretti coming out of turn number two as he goes down the back straight. He's beginning to work his way through some of the lap traffic. The lap traffic, of course, caused by the yellow flags that we have had. There's Johnny Parsons. Johnny Parsons, Parsons blowing on the track. Yeah. No indication as to what might be wrong there. He seemed to pick up a little power as he heads into the pits. That's Johnny Parsons, his father, a former race driver. Now let's go back to the leaders, Paul. Here's Gordon Johncock with Rick Mears right behind him. The separation one-tenth of a second as they came across the line. Now it's a drag race down that back stretch. There is some slower traffic in front of Johncock. Mears may have the better line coming into the third turn. They go for that bump heading into three. Johncock stays high. Mears stays on that line he prefers. Down a little bit lower on the bank. And it works for Rick Mears as Rick Mears begins to push ahead. Johncock responds on the high side. And it's still a drag race as Johncock and Mears are side by side. Very much like they finished the Indianapolis 500 this year. Pancho Carter has closed, Tom, on Andretti as Andretti and Carter come down the front straight. It seems that Gordon Johncock handled a little better in one. Mears handles better in two as Mears picks the lead up and screams down the back stretch. Johncock in pursuit. That's Garza sitting on the outside after his pit stop to repair his wings. Here is Mario Andretti still moving up through the pack. He is now up in sixth position, but he has dropped almost 10 seconds behind the leader. And that's Pancho Carter in car number three, the defending champion, sitting in seventh place right behind Andretti. As Pancho begins now a fight with Andretti, he pulls up and wants to sit just off the back end of Andretti's car. You'll notice that Pancho will try and keep his car a little offset from Andretti's. That's because there is a draft behind these cars, and if Pancho gets too close in, he won't have any wind to work his ground effect, so he has to keep some fresh air passing over the car. Look at Pancho Carter as he nails the throttle and works a little bit better than Andretti and comes past Andretti, so now Pancho Carter has moved up to sixth place, but Andretti's not going to let him be. Andretti returns the challenge on the backstretch, going into three. Pancho comes back. What a battle we're seeing here, Charlie. It has truly become a ballet of inches. 250 laps, 1,000 left-hand turns. There's Pancho Carter, as he has now decidedly begun to move out ahead of Mario Andretti. Andretti seemed to just drop back all of a sudden, so the question now will become, is there something wrong in Andretti's car? Is there something good in Carter's car? Or has Andretti decided, I'll just wait a little while? 34 laps are complete. Rick Beer leading with John Cock running second. Kevin Kogan is third. A.J. Boyd is fourth. Mario Andretti, we continue to watch him in seventh place, 11 seconds behind the leaders. Pancho Carter has picked up and moved out and around and has now moved up into fifth place. Here we're back with the lead once again. Rick Mears is leading the race, encountering some slower traffic. Right behind him is Gordon Johncock. Johncock is uh, now a full second back as Mears once again pulls out a bit of a lead. There are the two of them heading through the third turn. You can see the interval between our leader, Rick Mears, and car number one, Gordon Johncock, one second back. Again, Johncock now has decided to use a little lower line coming off of the fourth turn. Apparently, he saw it working for Rick. So it is Rick Mears, Gordon Johncock, Kevin Kogan, A.J. Boyd, and Pancho Carter running is the top five. The weather continues to hold. We had a forecast that we would have rained this afternoon, but it has cleared up. The forecast is that it will rain this evening. We hope that it holds. There's the top five. We'll be back to racing in a moment. Charlie Jones, we're back at the Michigan 500. 38 laps are complete. Rick Mears is our leader. John Cock in second. Kevin Kogan, the teammate to Rick Mears, has moved up.
up to fourth place. But an excellent race being driven here today by A.J. Foyt. Foyt currently sits back in fourth place. And, Charlie, he's been very smart right from the going. There you see that famous number 14, the Coyote Orange of A.J. Foyt. The car, actually a march, though. He's given up on the Coyotes. He knows this car goes perfectly well. And Foyt knows it's a long race, and he's just going to sit back and watch the leaders through this part. He is a veteran of IndyCar racing, as everyone knows, a total of 67 wins, four times winner at Indianapolis, seven times a national driving champion. Out in front of him is Mike Mosley, who has been running rather well, but Mosley is a lap down. There's a story concerning that. Let's go to Gary Gerald for that report. Charlie, the problem here developed on the yellow flag was one that Mosley in car number 18, also Whittington in number 91, both passed the safety car. That's a definite part violation. Consequently, when the green came back out, both Whittington and Mosley were commanded to come into the pit. They had to make what they call a stop-and-go run. They come to the pit, they come to a complete stop, then they're way back onto the track. It's a costly procedure on the green. That's why Mosley is running a lap down. That's why Whittington is no longer up there in the top five. All right, Gary, one question, one quick question. Right. Why does that happen to a driver in that situation? Well, it's a situation where it depends where the pace car comes onto the track. In this instance, the pace car comes on between turns one and two. The pace car, of course, has to get up to speed. The speed for the pace car is 90 miles an hour. Mosley's got a problem, Gary. Mike Mosley has a problem. He's apparently let an engine go. He's got his hand up in the air to tell everyone behind him he's slowing down. And something ripped away. I hesitate to say it's a tire. It might have been part of his skirt. So the right front tire now begins to wobble badly. So it began to flatten. And that brings Rick Mears, our leader, into the pits, as well as the second-place car of Gordon Johncock, with 41 laps complete now. The leaders decide to come in. Let's pick up some fuel. Uh, apparently, too, Rick Mears decides that it's a good time to pick up right-side tires, as does Gordon Johncock. So they are now, as a result of, of, as a result of these changes on the racetrack, deciding that the tires are going away. And A.J. Foyt picks up the lead with a stop by Mears and by Johncock. Johncock now coming out of the pits. Interesting as far as the Pitsky cars, normally their pits are at the far end of pit lane. However, this year they moved him to the front end of pit lane. They wanted to avoid congestion coming into the pits, such as happened at Indianapolis. Well, at Indianapolis, as Rick Mears was coming into the pits, he had to slow very quickly for another car that was in the wrong lane. And so Roger Penske doesn't like that. Here is the new leader, A.J. Foyt. Now, he stayed out when this yellow flag came out, and he had no need for any any tires or anything else so he's decided he's going to stay out on the course it's also interesting uh, charlie to note that on that last set of stops rick mears only changed the two right side tires and gordon johncock decided he needed three tires the left rear then the right side tires here's andretti in so mario comes into the pits as he continues to make his move currently in sixth place after starting in 33rd place and there's Mike Mosley as he picks up a new set of tires. Apparently that right front was the only problem. He got the car around safely into the pit area. You'll notice that Andretti has decided, just like John Cock, to change his left rear and his two right side tires. And so coming out of the pits is Mario Andretti. A.J. Foy, Foy in the lead. You know he was involved in the accident here a year ago, and earlier we asked him what he could remember about that accident in turn two. Yeah, everything was going along pretty good that day, and uh, we were in the back of the pack. You know, we was running, I think, fourth or fifth before the wreck happened, and then I made a couple of stops on the yellow, and the reason why I wanted to change the chassis up, so it was like 22nd, 3rd, and then the green come out. You know, we went from like 23rd to 10th or 11th. And actually, we haven't really figured out what really broke. I know when I went in there, everybody just went straight across the track, straight in the fence. our current leader in car number 14. Now, just before he came into the pits, Mario Andretti had finally moved up to third place. But because of his pit stop, he'll be forced back a little bit. A.J. Foyt is the leader under the yellow. Now, A.J. Foyt turns down toward pit road and comes down to Jack Starn and his crew, and he will pick up some very fast service. And that should give the lead now to Poncho Carter, assuming that Carter doesn't come in. One of the problems coming into the pits, for those of you that drive on the highway, you notice if you're going 55 or 60 miles an hour, you drop down to 14 to 40 miles an hour. I'll get back to that story. Let's go down to Gary Gerald. 
Charlie, here's the problem here for Mike Mosley. It's very evident. He cut down the tire somehow, may have run over some debris out on the race course. Once that happens, of course, it immediately just begins to chew up and shred up. It's very hard to control a race car. Mosley did a superb job. He got it back into the pits. It cost him a lot of time, of course. This tire off, a brand new one on. Mike's back on the track now. Charlie, I'm surprised at, uh, at how that tire actually handled it. Uh, you can see it flapping, and I thought that's what I saw when I first saw this occur on the race course. But then the tire seemed to hold in place, and Mike Mosley did a nice driving job to get it around the pits. Mosley, in his 60th year of driving Indy cars, has a total of five wins. And a look at A.J. Foy. trying to get the field to catch up because they'd like to get the green flag back on once again, the green light back on once again, Charlie. Let me finish that story quickly of coming into the pits. You notice when you drop down, as we look now at our leader, when you drop down in speeds on the highway, it seems like you're going a lot slower than you actually are. And when they come into the pits at 90 to 100 miles an hour, and then they slow down after being out at 200 miles an hour, it seems like they're just crawling along visually, and they really have to work on that to be able to duck in the pits and stop right on the mark. Now they begin to pick the speed up once again. The pace car off of the fourth turn, down into the area. There is Poncho Carter and his brand new march as he brings them down to the green flag. And we're racing once again. Poncho Carter out in front of the field, coming across the line, back to green flag racing. Howdy Holmes just out in front of Poncho Carter, but Carter being scored at this moment as first on the race course. So the man that won here one year ago is leading once again. six or seven cars behind them. Of course, some of them are a lap down, but he continues to make his move from the back of the pack, and now will be running very quickly among the leaders. Let's take a look at a fight for second place right now as Gordon Johncock and Rick Mears are dueling with one another once again. Poncho Carter out in front of the field, but Johncock and Mears, who have been fighting since we started the race, are still fighting, only this time it's for second place. Joe Carter opening up the lead of about two football leagues as he starts down the back straight here at the Michigan 500 with 47 laps complete of a total of 250 laps that will be run. Charlie, the black flag was just given to A.J. Foyt in car number 14, so apparently some sort of infraction that the officials noticed, and Foyt will be called in. It might be one of those stop-and-go actions. We'll have to wait and watch and see what happens as Poncho Carter in car number three comes across the line. There's A.J. Foyt. Now, he is ordered to respond to this black flag. There will be an official on a two-way radio in his pit position, and they'll tell him what they expect. Foyt probably say that he didn't see the black flag. He's going to continue out on the racetrack. It is possible that he did not. He continues at speed, but the black flag has now been given to car number 14. And a car is slowing on the track in turn two. One car down low as we continue to watch Foyt. Slowing on the race course, Scott Freighton, Scotty's home, he's uh, only about 12 miles from here. He's trying to make his first really big break into IndyCar racing. His dad, Lee Brayton, fine race driver himself, but Scotty's got some problems. Here comes Boyd again. Let's go down to the pits and Gary Gerald as Boyd comes into the pits. Well, just as you speculated, uh, that is, seems to be the problem. Boyd apparently passed the pace car. They are going to bring him in, according to Jim Gilmore and the crew. We're anticipating that AJ should be coming in. Here he is right now. It's simply a stop and go situation. He stops. Gets back he burns the tires. The rubber actually flying back here behind the pit wall as A.J. gets back on the track. And I suspect that that Texan is none too happy about that, but the officials did determine that Foyt passed the pace car, and so they bring him in for a stop and go penalty. And the only thing burning in car 14 is A.J. Foyt and not the tires. From high above the Michigan 500, our racing action continues with a total of 55-0 laps complete. Macho Carter has the lead. Is out debris on the track courtesy of this car, Mike Mosley. Well, Mike.
Posey in, in that Craco March uh, apparently lost a side panel. There it is laying on the racetrack. Now what it is is a piece of fiberglass that covers the top of the pod on the right side of the race car. You can see it's missing there. You can see all the inner working to the race car, the intercoolers, the cooling system on the car. Now he came in, he stopped, but because the yellow is out, I suspect his crew decided let's go send him back out. Let's find out how it works in that mode and maybe the safety crew will bring in an undamaged top or we'll get one from the garage area and be able to make a replacement. So Mosley is out without that one side on the car. There's the leader, Rick Mears, car number one. In second place, Gordon Johncock. But of course, Mears had to move around Poncho Carter to get into that position. He's slow under the yellow right now. But Rick Mears, here he was in pursuit of Poncho Carter just a few moments ago. Poncho Carter, number three, out in front. Mears on the back stretch using acceleration and a little bit of draft work on that tremendous BC-10 of his as he moves past the march and assumes first place. Rick Mir is now out in front and of course we are currently under the yellow. Total of 54 laps complete. Now let's take a look at uh, while we have the yellow flag at baseball's Say Hey Kid. His name of course is Willie Mays and he's the subject of a years ago today. Racing with 62 laps complete. Rick Mears and John Cock battling for the lead right now. Mears has it. And Dreddy has moved up from 33rd to 3rd. Kevin Cogan is in 4th. Al Unser and Jeff Brabham continue to battle for 5th place. But right now, let's go back to the start of the race. Paul Pay. Well, Charlie, I'm not so sure that the uh, these two drivers believe that they ought to take it easy while they're running. Here is the green flag as it came out just moments ago. Switching from yellow. That was Rick Mears out in front at that time. But look at this tremendous charge by John Cock. I think he just got the drop on Mears as they came off the fourth turn. That's Mario Andretti and Kevin Cogan sitting right behind them and then Mike Mosley who is several laps behind now. But John Cock and Mears continued to run hammer and tong back and forth constantly. Now John Cock is running with three fresh tires and the crew has reported that on both those Wildcats that the new tires have helped substantially in the handling. And there's evidence as it as John Cock is sitting up high on the banks but Mears running down low and these two guys apparently want to run the whole season like this, side by side all the way. John Cock high, Mears down low as they come across the line in a dead heat. The two guys are really seeming to have a good day with it, but the question you have to ask is whether or not they'll be able to do it for 500 miles. continuing to happen. Here was Mario Andretti as he closed on Kevin Kogan. Kogan at that time was sitting in third place, but Andretti picking up again, better handling because of an advantage in his stop. Look at him just simply breeze past Kogan. Now Kevin before the race said that he definitely was going to take it easy. He wanted to stay in touch with the leaders, but he didn't want to fight with them in the early going. We only have 65 laps complete. Andretti apparently wants to be up in front. And we did receive a report from Gary Gerald in the pits from talking with the uh, Andretti pit is that they say that as the afternoon progresses, particularly after they come in on the pit stop, that he says the car is running better and better and better. Now let's go down to Bruce Jenner. Bruce? We're with Jim, we're with Jim Hall right now. And Jim, Johnny Rutherford has been out there. He's 10 laps off the pace right now. He's got a brand new car, first time on the track. Is it just as they got the new car blues? It's going to take a while to get the kinks out? Yeah, it's... Uh, We've had some problems today, uh, and I think it really is new car blues. We just uh, finished the car up before we got here. We haven't uh, run it very much. Uh, we've had some problems on the track with a blower hose today, and, and now it looks like uh, we're probably out of the race. So uh, it hasn't been a very successful race. Yeah, he just pulled behind the wall, and uh, he's going to be getting out of the car. So I can't hear you, Bruce. He just pulled off, and he's off behind the wall. He, he, and he just pulled off, and uh, I think he'll be going behind the wall. I'll have to look and see, but I think so. Yeah, he is back there, but uh, tough luck. But we'll be seeing you again the next one. Yes, sir. All right. Very tough, tough luck for Johnny Rutherford. His car number five rolls into the garage area. Johnny stays with it the whole way. They were working at the back of the car with that floor hose. Charlie, that's very, very hot, confined area, so I suspect there might even be a few tiny burns on some crew members' hands. There is Rick Mears, the leader, car number one. He's been averaging just over 195 miles an hour. Second place, Gordon Johncock. 
place continues to be Andretti. Andretti again, in case you joined this late, in his backup car, the fastest qualifier, but when he had to go to the backup car because he, he put his number one car into the wall here yesterday, that means that he moved to the 33rd position at the start. But boy, did he have a great early part of the race. Now running third behind Mears and John Cox. There's Mario Andretti as he continues to battle up toward the front in third place right now, just six seconds behind Rick Mears. As he comes around the uh, slower car of Garza, takes him up on the high side and moves smoothly through traffic. 34 seconds separates from first place down to 11th place, so they're still running very close together. 68 laps complete. This developing into a very grueling race. It's 500 miles, a total of 250 laps here today at the Michigan 500. There's the crew members giving the board to Mario Andretti, telling him he's running just over 190 miles an hour. In third place, 70 laps complete. He's about seven seconds behind the leader. Look how close he comes up to that wall, Charlie. Mario Andretti, he's, he's known for that. He loves to throw the car right up. He comes up to the wall so close in some cases that he actually cushions the air between the outside tires and the wall. Now look at Mike Mosley, who had his problems earlier, and Mosley is running well down off the, off the lead. He's several laps behind, but apparently he wants to catch up as well. He pulled alongside Andretti and moved past them. That might indicate that Andretti has now settled down and is satisfied with his current position of third place. We're about the point of the race where you start to think as a driver like a marathon runner. You have to start now into pacing yourself out because you have a total of 250 laps in the race. 70 laps are complete. Mario Andretti, our current third place car, 8.9 seconds behind the leader. Mike Mosley, who's just in front of him, is three laps off of the pace. Mosley's in 17th place. There's the leader. And Paul, as I mentioned, a grueling race here today. Well, also, another kind of grueling race. The Tour de France bicycle race continues. Let's go across the Atlantic. We'll have a report there. Captain Richard Daniels from Burbank, California. The Enterprise, by the way, is named after the winner of the 1932 America's Cup race in Newport, Rhode Island. We now have 89 laps complete. The leaders have been in and out of the pits. The standings are just about the same. You haven't missed that that much. Here's the battle for second. Mario Andretti, he had some problems in the pit. Well, Mario Andretti was running with the leaders a few laps ago and came in for a pit stop under the green. The crew apparently had to repair some problems on the right side of the race car with the skirts. But then, as soon as they got that work done, you can see them checking there, they went to the back of the car, started to push him away. I told you there had been and Decker problems with these cars. There's evidence of it. Andretti stalls the race car. They try to get it rolling. They can't. The rule is they have to pull the car back. He lost one lap as a result of that. But here he is battling with his teammate, Gordon Johncock. Mario Andretti alongside Johncock and continuing that battle. And so Andretti continues to be a major part of the story of this Michigan 500 starting in the 33rd position and now running amongst the leaders as he has from about 40 or 50 laps into the race. We now have 91 laps complete. The weather forecast continues to stay the same. That would be showers this evening and not this afternoon. So the track is clear and they're running. There's Mario Andretti as he continues his battle up through the field. Mario Andretti and A.J. Foyt in that fight as well. Michigan 500. Mears with a total of 15. IndyCar wins to his credit. We'll be back with more of our coverage here. Right now, let's go back to the Tour de France bicycle race. Continue the battle here today. The 
as they have had this year. Let's go to Foyt. There's Kevin Kogan as he is pursuing Mario Andretti and sitting right back behind them is A.J. Foyt in car number 14. Kogan has apparently decided it's time to go racing once again and he picks up speed. There is Gordon Johncock, the third place car, sitting right behind him. Now, Kevin Kogan is one lap behind the leaders and A.J. Foyt is in fourth place. So those cars are all figuring in the front of this field. But Kevin Kogan has moved out to try to become part of this battle, which is between between Andretti on the left of your screen and John Cock on the right. The leader is Rick Mears, almost seven seconds out in front of second place Mario Andretti. The battle is right here for a second place as John Cock tries to get around Andretti once again. The team cars of the Patrick Racing Team are running side by side on that race course. There's Hal Lunzer in car 10 out in front. That machine worked well for him. He's on lap behind but he is currently running in fifth place with 103 laps complete and the average speed just over 150 miles an hour. And Reddy moves smoothly past Al Unzer. And Reddy is in second place. Now Gordon Johncock will contend with Unzer. He comes down low. Pancho Carter, who led this race in the early going, is now in seventh place, sitting back one lap behind the leaders. Pit stops have made a difference as now Andretti drops below Jeff Rattle. John Cock follows him through, and that battle for second place continues around. But John Cock falls way high through the turn. The top seven Rick Mir, Mario Andretti, Gordon John Cock, A.J. Foyt, Al Unser, Kevin Cogan, and Pancho Carter. And there is the leader in car number one that is Rick Mears. Pancho Carter is a tail ender this point even though he is running seventh in the race with a total of 106 laps complete. Apparently the race has gone smooth. There's Pancho Carter. We have had 18 lead changes so far in the 106 laps as we're now approaching halfway 250 miles the halfway mark of this 500 mile race the second Michigan 500. Michigan 500 last year, of course, delayed a week because of rain. We had a threat of rain today, but thus far, it has held on. There's the PC-10, the gold charge of Rick Mears. An awesome machine. When he brought it to the first race of the season back in Phoenix, Arizona, he shattered the track record, won the race, did the same thing in Atlanta, and the car has just handled perfectly all along. There is Tom Bigelow in car number 72, the car that spun earlier up at speed once again. But there is your leader, Rick Mears. He is eight seconds out in front of the second place car as he moves around Bigelow. The second place car is Mario Andretti. And Gordon Johncock is sitting right behind Andretti. And you mentioned the consistency of Rick Mears winning the first two races. He also has a second, third, and a fourth to his credit in the five IndyCar races this year. All right, the Michigan 500 with Rick Mears out in front as the battle continues. 108 laps complete. We'll be back. Stay with us. Ever-changing standings here at the Michigan 500 with 111 laps complete. The yellow flag is out. Jerry Carl is stopped on the track in turn four. And what a lucky break that is for A.J. Foyt, who was sitting on the race course without a refueling stop. He was running up with the leaders. In fact, he'd done a remarkable run, moving up to second place, I think partially because his car was physically so light without fuel. Now Foyt can take advantage of that yellow as he is doing at this very second with the rest of the field slowed. Foyt heads down for routine service from his crew. Mario Andretti, the third place car, is also coming into the pits. And actually, Foyt comes across the line just far enough in front of the leaders that he actually picks credit for this lap as the leader. There's Mario Andretti's car. Again, a change of three tires, the two rights and the left rear, as they are doing on A.J. Foyt's car. The refueler is doing their work. Disconnect from Andretti's car. No stall of that engine this time. Let's